Hello again, and welcome back to Stories Lived, Stories Told. I'm Abby, and I am so glad that you have joined me again today. Today is another mini-sode, so just you and me hanging out. We are two episodes in, so before we go any further, it is important to me that I am not a stranger to you. The conversations that we are having and that we will continue to have is a lot of personal, vulnerable stuff. And I can't ask my guests, or you, my listener, to lean into that if I'm not willing to do the same. Besides, my hope is that this podcast and the conversations that we have are able to be models, to give you the language and the understanding and the tools to bring these meaningful conversations into your own life and relationships. This episode, I am going to spend some time introducing myself. So let's jump right in. You already know my name is Abby, and my pronouns are she, her. And I want to start by sharing my connection to this theory. Right now, at the time that I am recording this in March 2022, I am a senior at Ball State University studying interpersonal communication. I first learned about CMM in my communication theory class in the spring of 2020. I guess I have always loved stories, but I don't think I would have said it like that until I learned about this theory. And I definitely didn't understand the complexities of storytelling and all the factors that can influence it. I think I connected with this theory so much because... I like the idea that I could actually create the social world I want, that I have any amount of influence or that my actions and words could actually mean something. Growing up, my dad would always say, make it a great day instead of have a great day. So I think I really internalized that mindset that instead of going through my day, just hoping something good would happen to me, that I could actually give myself more power over the outcome of my day and make a good day for myself. And to me, that is an empowering mindset. Now, it does also mean that resting does not come naturally to me. So that is something I try to be aware of too, especially because as a student, there is a lot of emphasis on productivity and filling your schedule and achieving. Speaking of achieving, I think the first place that I found myself really engaging with storytelling was on my high school speech team. For those of you who don't know, a lot of high schools have competitive speech teams where we perform 10-minute speeches that are either interpretive pieces like plays or short stories, or we give public address speeches that are informative or persuasive. I joined the speech team my sophomore year of high school after I did not make the cut for the musical, which was devastating to my 15-year-old self, but was actually the best thing to happen to me because I wouldn't have found speech without it. And that was kind of a big deal at the time because I never felt like I had a thing in middle school or early high school. I wasn't athletic. I didn't play any sports. I wasn't really in other clubs. The only community I had were people in show choir, which is a whole other thing that I know is big in Indiana, but not everywhere else. Basically, we learn a 15-minute set where we sing and dance and compete against other schools. And I loved that, but all my friends who were in show choir also did the musicals. So that is where I went to. And I love musicals, but I was more of a chorus person than a lead actress person, so it didn't really feel like it was mine. Like, like it was where I belonged. But then, like I said, I auditioned, but didn't make the musical my sophomore year. And then I joined Speech shortly after that. And looking back, I really couldn't tell you what possessed me to join the Speech team. I hadn't really done a lot of public speaking before that. And for Speech, we would get up at like 5 a.m. on a Saturday and put on a suit and then go compete all day against other high school students. It sounds wild, and there's no logical reason for me, a high schooler, to elect to spend my Saturdays that way, but I did, and I loved it. And I got to tell stories and watch other people perform stories that made me feel things. I laughed, I cried, I learned new ideas. It was really incredible for me. And 
I can honestly and wholeheartedly say that I wouldn't be who I am without speech. After high school, I joined the speech team at Ball State, and now it's my last year. And I've been doing competitive speech for seven years of the 22 years that I've been alive. (laughs) It's so strange to think about, but it has been such an important part of my life. I mean, I owe all my confidence to speech. And it's what grew my love of words and communication. When I would write speeches, it was so fun for me. I absolutely loved trying to find just the right words to say exactly what I meant. I loved playing with the words, trying out different ways of saying things. It was, it was like a puzzle to me. College speech is where I started to really learn the power of stories. The topics we addressed are much more intense now than in high school, which makes sense. I would go to competitions and watch performances about domestic abuse or people's experience with racism or homophobia and hear people's real lived experiences or people performing poems or prose or stories that someone else published. And it was also my first experience with advocacy. I've written persuasive speeches the last four years and really had the chance to find causes that I was passionate about and to form opinions and find ways to take action, which I guess is really full circle to me wanting to engage with these issues and injustices and pay attention to what wasn't working and hear people's stories and figure out action that could be taken. Also, some of the best people I know are people I met through speech. I always say that this group of people are the wittiest people I know. So intelligent and funny. And I just love being around them. There's a quote, and it's attributed to a lot of different people, so I don't actually know who said it first, but it says, if you are the smartest person in the room, then you need to find a different room. And let me tell you, the speech team is my different room. I never feel stupid or small, but definitely not the smartest in the room. I know I am surrounded by smart smart people. And I know that having this community has shaped my whole college experience and I will just forever be grateful for that. So I know I said that I was going to tell you my story and all I have talked about is speech. But that really is a huge part of my story at this point in my life. But there really is more to me than speech, I promise, I promise. Um, I want to tell you about some of the things that I think. Now, I know it's really cheesy, but I am a sucker for a good quote. Which makes sense, right? Because I love finding the words to express something that I didn't have words to express before. And when someone else can express something that I relate to, you know, something you read or hear and you just know in your body that it's true. To me, it's like a sigh of relief. But also energizing and exciting when I see a quote and it's just like, yes, that. Because then you have language that you can adopt and use to express yourself now. One of my favorites is a Lao Tzu quote that says, at the center of your being, you have the answer. You know who you are. You know what you want. The idea behind this quote is so important to me because really only recently in my life have I felt like I've started making decisions based on my own wants and personal boundaries instead of what I think other people want. For most of my life, I have been a textbook people pleaser. But It was really this past summer when I had some decisions to make that I realized were too important to leave up to other people or to try to get everyone to agree with me and what I already knew that I wanted. I think I've been taught, even if only subtly, to look for my answers outside of myself, to look for consensus among my friends or family instead of what I try to do now, which is find consensus in my head my heart and my gut. Another thing that I think is that people in my generation are really good at not caring. 
or I guess at least pretending not to care. I see caring as a very vulnerable act. To be honest and to admit that you care about something is absolutely vulnerable. Because what you were saying is that you would be upset if it got taken away from you. Whether it is a relationship or a job or an opportunity or, or whatever else you may care about. I first saw this in high school, which is a hard time all around, right? Everyone's figuring out who they are and how they want to be in the world, and everybody sucks, and everybody's just trying their best. But I found myself reining in how much I cared. Like I said, I like to participate, but I found myself biting my tongue in class because you know, God forbid I did anything to make people think that I actually cared about school and learning. And it's all about fitting in, too. I don't know. I, everyone's experience, of course, is unique. So I can really only speak for myself, but that is what I know to be true of high school. And it wasn't until I found this next quote that I stopped stopping myself from caring. The quote is much longer, but the important part is this, from Marianne Williamson's 1992 book, A Return to Love. It goes, As we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. I just think that is so beautiful. And in my mind, you can insert the word care in this and it stays the same if we honestly and openly care then we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same as we are liberated from our own fear of caring too much our ability to care automatically liberates others so now i try not to hide how much i care because i know that i have a lot of passion and care for the things that are important to me, and I can't make everybody else care like I do. And I recognize it would be a waste of my time and energy to try to convince people of things, but I know what I can do is go about my business and care and care and care and let that be enough. And even if people don't care about the same things that I do, maybe it will give them the courage to show care for something else. So this is my honest moment right here. I really care about this podcast. I care about the people I want to have conversations with. I care about creating something meaningful. I care about empowering people in communication. I care about doing this well. And that's really scary because... The perfectionist in me says, don't do it at all if you can't do it perfectly. But the creative voice inside me is working on letting that go and lean in to being vulnerable by putting this out into the world and into your hands and trusting you to let it be what you need it to be. Robbie said that about his work too in the last episode, that he spent so much time editing out the best parts of his writing but has now come to a place where he can write what is true to him and then release it, and it's okay if not everybody resonates with it. It meant something to him, and that's what matters. He can only hope that his caring and vulnerability in sharing can encourage someone else to be brave enough to do the same. And this means something to me. And that is enough. Well, thank you for listening to my story. Like we noted in our conversation with Robbie, this is not the whole story. In fact, there are some parts of the story that we haven't even processed yet, and so much more of the story still left to happen. Too much to talk about in just 15 minutes. So I won't try to pretend that this is the whole story, but it's a start. And that is where we are right now, working to bring care and intention and story to our relationships. <laughs> and if it's not something that you feel like you already do, it can be really challenging, right? We are 
creatures of habit. So we get stuck in our ways and forget that our lives and our relationships could look any different than they do, but they can. Thank you for letting me share my story. And I have a little challenge for you if you're up to it. I want you to tell your story, or at least one of your many, many stories. Pay attention to how it feels. And maybe you even want to ask someone you know to share a story of theirs with you too. Like I said in the trailer, I really do believe that everyone already has thoughts and feelings and ideas about their lives and their stories. And one of the best things we can do is ask to hear them. I'm Abby, and this has been Stories Lived, Stories Told. I'll see you soon.